And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, making his grand, making his grand return after about th after about three years when I was st when I still didn't know what the hell I was doing. The the creator of the Wild Sea and now returning with its first expansion, Storm and Root, the one and only Felix Isaacs. How are you doing today, man? Yeah, that's uh, that's me. Hey, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, it's <laughs> good to be back. It's good. To, it's good to be back. It's um. Thank you for thank you for being open to coming back. I know I've um. When I had when I had you on, when I had you on was was smack dab in the middle of the of the worst year and um. Yeah, yeah, that was pa pandemic. Was it end of pandemic year one or like start of pandemic year two? I think um, start of pandemic year two maybe. Yeah, Lockdowns was, and yeah, it wasn't good. It was back in it was back in September of twenty twenty. Yeah. Oh God. And ar around that time, I was st I was still fumbling about trying to figure out what the hell I was doing when it came to this whole interview thing. Mm. Uh, so I was fumbling around trying to wake up what I was doing with the whole writing thing. So you know, prob probably. But then, th but um, well, it's been it's been a few years since, and I've had I've had. Um, wait, I've had way too many interviews un under my belt since. Because <laughs> the, yeah, the count, the count is at six seventy one. I ended up having my laugh when the um, playlist count hit six hundred and sixty six. But I, th I think you've done more interviews than I've done pages, which is actually quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, because I'd admit, because um, I'd imagine it takes it takes it takes um. Well, it's gonna take. It takes more time doing an interview when I, when I structure them around an, around an hour or so, than a page. But how how long it takes to do a page is up for debate. Oh yeah, very much depends on the page. There are some that you fly through in like half an hour, and you look back and go, do you know what? That's actually pretty good. And there are some you agonize over for days. Yeah. So, I think beca because of the fact that it's been it's been three years. That's been three years. I think we need to do a bit of a bit of catch up. So before we get back into get get back into the meat and potatoes of things for Storm and Root, I think we need to um, refresh refresh the temple's memory on the Wild Sea. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so the Wild Sea is a fiction first TRPG. Um, it is about it kind of follows the the path of um, of, of crews, crews of wild sailors, who create a ship together uh, to sail the treetop seas. Because in the world of the Wild Sea, um, an event uh, many many years ago covered the entire world with forest, uh, destroyed almost everything. But the survivors and their descendants managed to rebuild. It is a, a kind of it's post-apocalyptic, but it's very bright post-apocalyptic. Um, it is it's it's looking forward to the future. Things are green. Things are good. Things are also incredibly dangerous. But like it's all danger that can be challenged and overcome. Yeah. Um, it is a very very kind of vibrant, very hopeful world, I guess. Would it um, be? But no, no less dangerous. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that it is? More of a post post apocalypse because of the fact that you do have civilizations and cu and cultures within the, within the setting. Yeah, I think that's entirely fair. Um, it's we, we try not to delve too much into the history of everything. I think there's literally about half a page out of the the core three hundred and sixty page book devoted to the actual history of the world because it's just you can feel that stuff in yourself as you play if it matters. Yeah. Um, yeah, but as essentially, things were whatever they were like before the verdancy happened, and then the verdancy happened, then everything was trees and death, and then now, hundreds of years later, things are dangerous, but still pretty good. Uh, in fact, for a lot of people, and a lot of uh, the bloodlines, and a lot of, of groups and cultures, better than they were before. Yeah. Uh, the dividing line I use whenever, whenever it comes to whether it's post-apocalypse or post-post 
is whether or not new societies, new um, co new cultures have um, emerged. Yeah, that's and, not and a bad dividing line, and the world seems full of them. <laughs> um, if I had to use another example of what I mean by this kind of thing, <laughs> probably the Genesis. Mm, yeah. Beautiful looking book as well, the Genesis. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just, just one that I don't think I'd ever get in print because, because it's gonna be, because that's gonna be pricey. Yeah. So now with Sto with with Storm and Root, th that's meant to be the that's meant to be the first expansion. If if you were to if if you were if you were to um kind to kind of summarize what the, the what the theme of the expansion is, what would you say, what would you say that it is? Uh, it is exploring the hungry skies in airships and exploring the root choked depths in submersibles. So, uh, although without a, without a true sea, submersible is a bit of a you know subarboreal. I don't know things that go under. Yeah, so we're go so we're going. It's going higher than no it's going higher than normal and lower than normal. Yeah, the first game was all about the wave tops, uh, the, the the kind of rustling waves. The crowns of the great trees that cover the world, and this is about going above them and below them. Yep. Now, when I when I was pitching the when I was pitch, when I would pitch the game to people I know, um, I would I would at times use say that the world post verdancy is not too far removed from Kashyyyk, just worse. Mm. Uh, since Kashyyyk in um, Star Wars, the home of the Wookiees, is is has the has layer upon layer of biome. Yeah. And I mean it's 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 definitely more Kashyyyk than Tatooine, so Yeah. And gr granted the granted the best the best presentation of Kashyyyk was with Knights of the Old Republic, even with all the backtracking, but that's another that's another matter entirely. It has been a long time since I played Kotor. Mm-hmm. But uh I do remember somebody making a supercut of all of all the backtracking to the song "Walk of Life," <laughs> hmm. but I suppose uh, since since we're dealing with the un the um the three re the three areas known as the under canopy, the sink, and the drown, um, I'd like to start with the under canopy in terms of the theming of it and how and how the verdancy is present there. As opposed to how it is uh, on the on uh, the treetops, as it were. Yeah. Um, well, the the kind of the, the topmost layer, excluding the the sky, is the thrash, and that's the bit that everyone's used to. Um, and then, as soon as you go under that canopy, uh, you you've got the tangle, which is where things get a bit well tangled. I'm, I'm a fan of direct names. Um, it, it's where there's there's so many branches, so many leaves, everything intertwines, vines, mosses, uh, spore clouds and fungus. Um, it, it becomes a struggle to move through it unless you're in a very big heavy ship. Um, so it's it's kind of the, the barrier of this is still explorable, but below this things get really, really wild. And then when you go down to the um, the sink, uh, so named because things tend to sink through it over time uh, and heading heading ever downwards, uh, the sink is even thicker, but also far more predatory. Everything there wants to kill you. It's a, it's a constant cycle of um, life and death for everything, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's so deep at that point, kind of uh, half a mile down probably. Uh, that, that there's just no light. It is this incredibly dark place, lit only by bioluminescent funguses and, and insects and things. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then, it, and then it goes really bad um, because the drown is called that because once you're down there, you're probably not ever going back up again because it's where the branches give way to large open spaces between the tree trunks of the the massive trees that make up the the world forest. Mm -hmm. And and then you've just got a long drop down to the ground. Yeah. And on the opposite end, when it comes to the sky, when it comes to the skies, obviously that needs that needs very specific types of ships because well, there's nothing to really cut through. 
Yes, yeah. Um, the, the kind of core conceit of most ships on the Wild Sea is they have some kind of chainsaw at the prow of them, or they move with kind of centipedal scuttling limbs or tentacles, or uh, there's a whole host of things that can draw a ship across the rustling waves. Mm -hmm. When it comes to airships, that was a, a whole different deal. Most ships that are, or, or function as airships, still have something to cut through things with um, for when they land, because you don't want to stay up there forever. Yeah. Uh, the sky itself is pretty hungry. But a lot of them have extra gas bags, lift devices of some kind, uh, there's spirit driven sails, there's oh there's a there's a there's a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Now when it comes now when it comes to that, what sort what sort of it's you what sort of um threats would there typically be within the within the skies? The um, they're kind of split into two halves. There's the the more physical ones, um, flying lizards, large predatory birds, the skyward leviathans, other airship pirates and marauders. That's another big one. Um, the, the whole kind of what you'd expect in terms of aerial threats, beasts and and whatnot. You know, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are kind of unique to the wild sea and, and kind of fun new ideas. But some of them really are just you know. Big Bird, because Big Bird is scary when you're a small ship. But the other side of it is the constant threat of scrutiny, which is the um, the fact that for crews who have spent their entire lives surrounded by branch and wave and, and life, they're suddenly up in the air. They can't hide. They, they can't really run. I mean, they can move at speed if they're lucky, but there's no way to escape being seen apart from possibly rising above the cloud layer, and then you're just being seen by the stars instead. So uh, the, the, the threat of scrutiny is more of kind of a, a psychological pressure in some ways. But it also means that you are literally exposed. Everything below you, everything around you, everything above you can see you for the first time. Where And that, and that can be an issue because, as I, as I recall, there's a bit, there's a... There's an element of ke of keeping up, keeping out of sight of the bigger predators, um, oh, yeah, down below. Mm. In um, scrutiny, the the kind of skyward, uh, the new skyward system we've got for it, uh, a lot of it is to do with trying to escape the notice of things, because once things have noticed you, it's a big empty sky. They're not going to forget about you quickly. No, well, and um... and you'll have to land at some time. <laughs> Yeah, you get you gotta land eventually, and I didn't for whatever for whatever reason the one when you mentioned big when you mentioned big threatening birds, one of the first things that came to mind is the is the um, yearly annoyance that is Australian magpies. Uh, I, what's wrong with Australian magpies? I've never heard this. This this could be a good this could be a good potential threat. Tell me about Australian magpies. There are there are certain. There are certain an there are certain animals that have that have um, what could be referred to as black air force energy. The kinds of animals that will pick a fight with anyone and everyone just because they're there. Mm. Australian magpies. They're normally they're not as they're not that much of a problem except for except for like six weeks out of out of the year known as swooping season, where they will re they will repeatedly dive bomb at people's at people's heads if they're too close to their space. Oh, I like a good aggressive bird because I don't have to live near them, so it's fine. So it's it it ends up being advised to wear helmets if you're out biking because they will dive bomb for your head, and if you get hit once, you can expect to get hit by them again next year. Mm, that makes sense. Oh, uh, when I I had a, a a kind of similar but far less head trauma inducing thing with the crows in Japan because Japan doesn't have much in the way of pigeons but has a load of crows and they are expert food thieves and very opportunistic. Yeah, crows crows are they that's been a pro crows have been a problem in parts of Japan for years because they will they will also pick fights with just about everybody. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Obviously, the king of picking fights with anyone and everyone is is the honey badger, but um, there but there's a but there's others Waltz, that he has no honey badgers. I've missed a trick there. Yeah, they there's an infamous story of a honey badger picking up picking a fight with a with a group of lions, getting his ass kicked, getting nursed back to health, and then going right back to pick a fight with the same group of lions. I can imagine that. I've had tales of the honey badger. Mm-hmm. Like I, I know there's the meme of the honey badger don't care, but um, <laughs> it's 
it sometimes 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 those sort of things have a kernel of truth to them. Yeah. Oh. Now usually, and I've met. And I've I th I believe that there was one I believe I can't recall what it, I can't recall the name of it. There was one that had this in New Zealand that had a um, really distinct hooked beak that would that was notorious for um, carjackings. <laughs> you know, just just breaking into cars, take taking taking things apart, and trying to steal what's in it. Yeah, including one story of of one of these birds stealing a guy's passport. But, I, I see. I'm not the biggest fan of birds, but they are kind of impressive in their way. Yeah, very well adapted. Yeah, I bring, I bring, I bring all that kind of thing up because if somebody, if somebody really wants to make monster design, they all that they'd ha all that they'd have to do is um, is take take what we already have in nature and just make it worse. Which oh um, yeah, yeah, in a roundabout way, you're already doing with the wild sea with all with all of the plants. Mm. Oh. Well, one of the um, one of the the new kind of you know quote unquote iconic creatures, as in it turns up in the art for the book more than once, is the uh, the red feather strigia, which is um, a large flightless owl, a very hench large flightless owl, and it is one of the the simpler creatures from the new book. It's a really angry owl, a very territorial angry owl that can't fly, but it's really really good at jumping and scrabbling and leaping. Yeah. So those pro so it's probably going to be a case of wa uh, watch out above you because it's even if it can't because um to to reference an old Samurai Jack episode if it can't it can't fly but it can jump good. Mm, yes, it, yeah, exactly. And they will happily drop down on you. Mhm. Mm Oh, I'm get. I'm guessing. I'm guessing there, since you mentioned that one of the big threats up in the skies is big birds. I'm guessing that they're pretty sizable. Uh yeah, there are some absolutely huge ones. Although, um, the the biggest threats technically in the sky are just living storms, um, because they can be miles across. We're we're talking a hurricane that can think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a. T and because it's the wild sea, some of them are even weirder than you might expect. Like uh, <laughs> clouds coming with rains of teeth that will chase you down, and then you dive down into the under canopy and, and think you're safe, but it will just uh, become a moving, rolling fog bank full of teeth and chase you down there too. A lot of living storms are very tenacious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which certain it certainly makes sense that 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 something like that would be up there because when with Sailor stories that we that we've had for that we've had for centuries in the real world. There's all manner of folk tales about weird things you see out you see out in the sea. Oh yeah, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from actual stories from old sailors, uh, especially from the kind of eighteen nineteen hundreds. Yeah, it's like well, you wouldn't believe what happened to this ship, and it's like no, I don't believe that that's what happened to that ship, but it's a great bloody story. Mm -hmm. And now give now. Taking taking that into account, taking that into account, the when it I know that for the ship for, that for the ship options, you have the notion of making things into airships or submersibles, and yeah. because of how because of how modular um, ship creation is, it's not that much of a stretch to adapt an existing ship into one of those, or just make one up, just make one from scratch. Yeah, you can do both options just fine. You can you can build an airship or a submersible from scratch, or you can just take your existing ship and start adding bits to it. Mm -hmm. Now, as I, now, um, I do I do remember get I do remember getting the playtest for Stor for Storm and Root quite some time ago. Um, yeah, um, I think it only covered Root. I think it was just submersibles that playtest. Yeah. and. Yeah. As I recall, one of the one of the mechanics that was introduced is pressure. Yes. Yeah. Um, pressure is the the kind of the dark mirror of scrutiny, um, where scrutiny when you're up in the in the wild blue, uh, scrutiny means that everything can see you. Pressure is pretty much nothing can really see you, but you're still being hunted and things are getting worse. Uh, pressure is. Uh, a mix of much like much like scrutiny, a mix of physical danger and psychological danger. The deeper you get, the more the pressure on your ship becomes. 
Um, and in some cases, that's that's a literal physical pressure. The branches and leaves pushing it around you. Um, swarms of insects and, and creatures trying to get in. Uh, the seals of your ship having to hold the sea out. Uh, but in other cases, it's realizing that you are dark and cold and alone and everything around you is hostile and you are in at some points like a mile from the surface you can't even ascend quickly because you've got to climb your way up in your ship through those those branches and leaves and, and mosses um, mm -hmm. so yeah pressure is pressure can get to you and there's a whole set of uh, like d66 tables for pressure effects oh oh yeah and um <clears throat> of course there is also the there's also a um sister mechanic no with snaps yes yeah um snaps snaps are one of the very new bits um like they've been in there for a while but they're only starting to get used in games recently uh because we're only we've only run a few play tests uh publicly so snaps are, snaps are still an unknown in terms of exactly how powerful they're going to be, mm -hmm. but they're essentially essentially they're just voluntarily making things worse to reduce the pressure on your ship and your crew. So you can take a, a little dose of badness personally, uh, narratively to, to to make things a little bit better for everyone around you, just for a moment. In that regard, could you see could you see them as a narrative equiv narrative or or me narrative slash mechanical equivalent of a of say a controlled burn, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, you're 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 taking a little bit of charge. You know things will be bad, but you can at least determine for a bit how bad they're going to be. Yeah, I I suppose another example I could use is how, um, in 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 a lot in a lot of <clears throat> places with with snowy regions, they will st they will set off many avalanches so that a bigger one doesn't happen. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But when it comes to when it, com when it comes to some of the new um, some of the new options, um, there's I'd like to I'd like to go through I'd like to go through a few of them just to just to get the feel for what for what we're dealing with. Um, yeah, different. Starting with the Itzenko. Yes. Oh, okay. So. Uh, the Itzenko um, are a rework of one of the earliest Wild Sea creations, um, the Mantids. They're actually, they appear on the art of the first book uh, for the core book, the standard edition. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were made to be kind of feral and dangerous, uh, sapient enough to be using tools, but still just a threat to be faced. But over the last few years, people have a... Uh, really taken on the idea that things evolve and grow and cultures change and that the Wild Sea is a place of genuine hope. Um, and they have also, almost in the same degree, I think, uh, ended up saying, actually, those mantids on the cover look really cool. I want to play as those. So I kind of combine those two ideas together. And, and the Itzenko are a, a new rework of the mantids. Um, fictionally, in, in the, the world of the Wild Sea, the, the last emerging bloodline. Like, they, they have only really started putting themselves together in recent years. Mm -hmm. And they have this um, kind of... Like uh, like all the cultures, there they have splits and schisms and, and kind of their own little enclaves and weird bits and some follow their own path and some follow the old ways, etc. But for the, for the Mantids, the Yatsenko, uh, there aren't many old ways to follow. So they're, they're generally on this journey of kind of self-improvement and self-discovery. Which, uh, because they are capable of molting um, and shirking their shells and changing their form, often has a physical component to it. They they literally remake themselves slowly again and again into exactly what they want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, on now when it comes to or when it comes to origins, there's the submerged, and I'm guessing that's people who were who were born on the lo on the lower ends. Yep, uh, you're pretty rare, but there are some survive and exist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Submerged is one of the origins that was not written by me. There is not much in the books that isn't written by me, but the Submerged is one of those bits. It was written by our head of playtesting, uh, Rick, also known as Cerebric Online. Fantastic guy with um, a good eye for the poetic, which I like. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he loved the concept of the Submerged, uh, growing up in the darkness, but making something good from it. Mm -hmm. Oh. 
And speaking of origins, there was also the Windward, which yeah, I, I um, as somebody who as somebody who always liked dragoons when I would, when I would play various Final Fantasies, the art of the Windward that I saw is going is going to be appealing to me. Yes, yeah, I do love that art. Again, that was art that was that was made. Um... A decent chunk of the ideas, the initial ideas for Storm and Root was just stuff we could not fit in the core book. And that art, um, which if, uh, if you might have it on screen right now, I don't know, um, it, of the, the kind of almost um, monk-like individual balancing on their spear. Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. So I had to do something based around it because it was just an initial sketch back then. Um, and the idea of the Windward came from that. Someone who just goes against the odds again and again and again. They they will try and try and try. Yeah. The, the, their whole story of their life is just there is something else coming and I will face it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm guessing the I'm guessing the diver post is is the is one of the primary one of the primary representations of those who go into the depths that other people think probably not the best idea to go into. Yeah, yeah, it, it's bravery or foolishness or both. Um, but at least divers are sensible enough to encase themselves in in big metal suits most of the time, at mm -hmm. least. Um, because as with as with all of the the posts and bloodlines and origins, there's a lot of different aspects to choose from, uh, and you only get to choose like two from each one. Sometimes one if you're playing uh, young young characters who are inexperienced. So there, are, I have already seen, in fact, a diver that does not have a pressure suit. Uh, one of the big chunky aspects that goes with it. I've seen a diver going down, essentially like a free diving type thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to ra when it comes to ravelers, um, ah yes, <laughs> how, I real I realize that they that their big thing is mo is controlling a, a kind of cloth, but yeah, cloth or fur. But um, what is how do you usually pitch the concept of the raveler to playtesters? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question because a lot of the time uh, it's just what wh what is what is happening with this? Why is this here? And then they'll look at it and they'll realize that it, it, the Raveler exists to allow people to play on kind of two ends of a, a massive spectrum um, because some of the Raveler stuff lets you be that elegant a kind of pseudo magical thing where you're controlling bolts of fabric maybe silk winding it around enemies kind of pulling them up into the air or soaring through the skies yourself trailing things behind you in the wind like really elegant really cool really uh, more on the traditional magic -y side than a lot of uh wild sea stuff is because mm -hmm. uh, we do we tend to avoid a lot of kind of quote unquote magic and go for weirdness instead yeah but by the same token um some ravelers just take the skin of a dead animal like a like the fur of a bear or something drape that over themselves and and then call it a day mm -hmm. so you you can you know using the same kind of rules uh you you can be the just the kind of weird guy dressed in in furs and leather with with massive claws as weapons just charged in the middle of a fight yeah and, and that generally sells the sells the post like playtesters tend to go oh okay <laughs> after yeah. that and of course, another post to that to um consi to consider is the thorn, which seems to seems to have a bit of seems to have a um symbiotic approach when it comes to the plants. Yes, yeah. Um, the thorn controls uh, to an extent uh, the waves around them, uh, plant growth and and lethality as well. Uh, but that comes at a cost. Most of them are host to parasitic plants of their own or will end up giving their entire bodies over to the sea at some point. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a case of dancing with the razor's edge. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, thorns, they never in the fiction at least, they don't last long. Mm -hmm. Or they don't last long as themselves. They might last long physically but, you know. Yeah. And there's a few others that weren't in the that weren't in the playtest that I did that I did want to go into. One of them, one of them being um, kite sailors. Yes, yeah, um, that is for the uh, more the airshipy side of things. Um, the 
the storm part of Storm and Root, uh, kite sailors take personal flight to the next level by relying on some of them balloons, but most of them actual kite sails, which are compact paragliders that rely on updrafts and, and storm winds. Um, for whatever reason, wingsuits immediately immediately came to mind. I've wanted to make a World Sea wingsuit, but I don't know how to put it into an aspect yet. I will do at some point, I'm sure, because the idea is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, if I can do personal hot air balloon stuff, I can do a wingsuit. Yeah. Uh, and of, of course, the other one being zealots, which, given that zealots are meant to worship leviathans, yeah. I think it'd be interest. It'd be an interesting challenge to see how they'd get on with uh, with other members of a crew. Oh yeah, zealots. Uh, um, pe people asked actually from from early on, like, is there going to be a kind of D and D esque cleric post? And I was like, well, there's a surgeon. Surgeons heal people. You know, there's the rattle hand. Rattle hand fixes things. They're both healing focused to an extent. And I'm like, no, no, on the religious side of things. And I generally try and avoid religion. Um, uh, I especially avoid things like naming specific gods. Like there are there are a couple that get name dropped in the text, but never in terms of a this is this god that definitely exists. It might just be like a local superstition or something. Um, so when it came to doing a zealot, something which is the closest we're probably ever going to get to a cleric, uh, the the initial question was, oh, well, so what do they worship? And the instant answer was, what is the biggest, scariest, most potent thing? that definitely exists, Leviathans. Mm -hmm. So most zealots just worship Leviathans. A few worship the wilds themselves, like the natural world. And a few might even worship old gods or new gods that they've made up. But most of them are essentially Leviathan cultists, yeah. styling themselves around um, existing Leviathans, or trying to seek out new ones to worship. And w would it be fair of me to say that among that... Um... Most most people look at zealots with a, with a little bit of a side eye, wondering if they're um, if they've got a a bit a bit of a screw loose. Oh yeah, there is, there is definitely a reason they're called zealot rather than like priest. Mm -hmm. um, that they are the people that have gone a bit a little bit loopy. Um, yeah. But that, to be fair, that loopiness is kind of appropriate for the world. They're not wrong in in what they're worshiping, um, and. From the way the the fiction around them is written, like a lot of them are completely aware. Leviathans don't know who or what they are. They don't care. They're they're massive beasts, um, but they can still be inspiring, and they can still, in some ways, lend power. So, mm -hmm. oh, now, when it comes to diving too deep, you had the pressure mechanic. Do you have yeah. something similar for those who are up in the skies? Uh, the closest we get to that is scrutiny, but scrutiny is uh, far less. Uh, what's the right word for it? I suppose a far less technical than pressure, far less modular. Um, scrutiny is is kind of a switch, like, or uh, I guess a three way switch. You have not been noticed. You've been noticed a bit. Oh, things are re-noticing you now, and yes, yeah, things have got their eye on you completely. Um, and everything that happens within scrutiny happens within those stages. Whereas pressure is this kind of uh, multi-stage thing where different bits are tracked, there are different effects that start up and, and go on. It might affect different people differently too. So yeah, pressure is um, far more complex. But that's because the layers of the sea underneath um, the canopy are far more complex than the sky. So yep. I think it makes sense. Yep. As an aside, when I was looking at the staff for the project, I ended up getting a bit of a chick a bit of a um, tickle that <laughs> that one of the one of, that you you somehow managed to get you somehow managed to get Leo to help out with uh, layout. So oh yeah, yeah. Like Leo, Leo's an absolute again. star. <laughs> yeah, um, I I found Leo back in there. Oh, uh, did he find me? One of us found the other one when he was doing parslings, which mm -hmm. is now that has some good art. Like yeah. I love our art, Omachan, Mon, Schmeckle. They do an amazing job, but. Parslings, such a tight book in terms of art direction, and it's because Leo does it all himself. It's yeah. it's incredible. He but, is a one man book creation machine, and I do not understand how he does it all. And he helped us out at the same time. So, um, yeah. maybe black tar Mexican heroin or something. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. It is it is impossible for a man to work that well and that fast. Uh, I'd like to say that, but then I remembered Brandon Sanderson exists. Uh, yes, I suppose so. Yeah. And uh, and how he and how he ended up writing like f 
uh, writing a bunch of manuscripts when he was supposed to be on vacation. To be fair, I know that feeling just not to the same degree that Sanderson would, because I ended up just writing a bunch of pages, then finish a vacation, and then go, eh, they could be better. Whereas he then publishes books. Yeah. Yeah. Now... When it can, now, um, one of the, one of the things that I do f I do find kind of kind of kind of interesting, kind of amusing is when you is on on the top of the Kickstarter page. You mentioned some of the, you mentioned some of the inspirations, which at the time we I think I dipped into with with you, but we didn't but we didn't go into any specific name drops. Um, yeah, possible. And I'm and because of the fact that I like to draw parallels. I'd like to go through. I'd like to go through the ones mentioned and just, just where, just where their mechanics are reflected in what you and what you do with the Wild Sea. Um, oh yeah, yeah, go for it. And the first one is Belly of the Beast, which that's um, a name I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> Belly of the Beast. Um, what was that? Sigil Stone, I think it was published. That. I think. I think. Are you gonna check it now? I think it's interesting. Yes, I'm going. I'm going to check. So I'm not, so I'm not talking out of my ass. Oh yeah, okay, that, that's fair. So give because I know because I have Belly of the Beast in my library, but um, it's mm, going yeah. to take a second Same. because I have a lot of books. <laughs> then let me talk about Belly of the Beast. Um, back when I uh, was developing the Wild Sea, um, I was doing it while I was living in a foreign country, while I didn't have many friends that played TTRPGs. Um, while most of my RPG experience was Pathfinder, D and D, Call of Cthulhu, um, and I wanted to make something fiction first, but I didn't know that years before, Powered by the Apocalypse had happened. Like there'd been this huge revolution of narrative-focused RPGs that I'd completely missed out on. Mm -hmm. um, and Belly of the Beast is one of the first new back then games that I read. Yeah. Um, and it just completely opened my eyes to like, I've been trying to do some of this stuff that they are doing. And I didn't always agree with the way things were done in Bay of the Beast because it has some really interesting but unusual resolution systems. Um, but the way it worked, the way it all worked as one mechanical passage, that was a massive inspiration. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I did check it was Sigil Stone. Yeah, I'm glad I remembered. Bay of the Beast, just a fantastic game. Mm -hmm. Um, blades in the dark. I can I can kind of I can kind of figure this one out, but I'd like to see, I'd like to see where your head was at with it. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say that like the Wild Sea is, is really close to being forged in the dark. Um, and I, I I accept that as a compliment, most definitely. But it wasn't made to be until I needed a a good solid dice resolution system. Um. And then I found Blades, and then I read Blades, or I bought Blades, and then I read Blades, and I read it the same day I bought it. I read the entire thing cover to cover and absolutely loved it. And then I went and watched um, the, the the Six Towers um, YouTube videos uh, with the, the playtest um, that they ran. And it was just absolutely amazing. And I realized that A they again had done that whole kind of fiction first thing and that a lot of the mechanics that I'd come up with they had done in a slightly different way and I'm happy with that um, I prefer some of theirs much like Heart like there's a lot of similarities and sometimes I prefer my way of doing it and sometimes I wish I'd found them earlier and just stolen their way of doing it because it's great mm -hmm. um, but when it came to Blades the, the final thing that clicked into place was like ah this dice pool system that you use that's the kind of thing I've been trying to emulate for the last half a year or so and failed at doing. So that that makes sense. Um, I've altered bits of it. Um, I essentially kind of took the uh, the, the the break of, of resolutions, the, the kind of 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, mm -hmm. and applied that um, to what I already had going on with um, track breaks and cart and a load of other stuff. Uh, but that, that core... Dice mechanic, so simple but so effective, really, really good, mm. and that is definitely a, a complete Blades influence. That bit, a lot of people um, tend to think that the, the concept of tracks is adapted from Blades' clocks, but that's weirdly enough the bit that looks like it should be, but wasn't. Tracks were there way before Blades um, was a thing in my head, uh, because tracks were stolen from something else entirely that wasn't even a TRPG, or at least the concept of them. Yeah, and 
truth be, this is the reason why this is the reason why I double check these kind of things because some things that may seem like obvious inspiration aren't. Oh yeah, exactly. I remember uh, one particular guy who, um, when our head of playtesting was doing a bit of outreach years ago, uh, one guy on I think it was a Facebook page or something uh, came back to him and said, "Oh, this is an obvious ripoff of Fate," and. And it, Rick got in touch with me and said, have you ever played Fate? And I was like, nope. Heard of it. Don't know what it is, really. And he goes, yeah. So you get back to the guy and says, he, he, the owner, um, the owner, the creator, the designer, he's actually never played Fate. I don't know why you're lying about this. And it's like, well, we're not. Like, I, I wear my influences on my sleeve. I literally mention as the first part of just about everything what the game of influence by. If it was influenced by Fate, I'd say it was influenced by Fate, but I just, I've never played it. <laughs> so... Yeah. Like I like I said, for for some for I guess the be, the best way for me to put it is there's a, there's an old there's a bit of a saying that I I use and I've used infrequently. Um those who go out looking for witches see them everywhere. Yeah, pretty much. It's just, it's one of those weird things. People get and people get so protective over like mechanics and systems and things, but of all the designers I've talked to, especially when you talk about, like, I love the way you solved that thing. No one goes, well, you can't use that. It's mine. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, great. I heard that works out for you. Adapt it. Do whatever you want with it. And I'm the same. Like, if people want to use bits of the wild, see uh, like the wild word system, um, concepts from that or mechanics from that, yeah, go for it. I don't care. If it makes your game better, it makes your game better. If it works for something you're doing, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. Now, of course... Not I've... everyone can do burning wheel, essentially. I, I do want I do want to cover Burning Wheel one of these days. I just need to find the right angle. Yeah, it's it was a it was a hell of a read and a game I'll probably never play. Oh. Uh, just because it's not because it's bad at all, but just because it doesn't quite sit right in my head. There are so many things in it that just aren't what I'm expecting them to be in the way things work. In all likelihood, but I'd probably one, one package. in all likelihood I probably would end up covering like Torchbearer or Mouse Guard. Mars mm -hmm. Mouse Guard is higher up on on the list because I will, I will never forgive whatever executive decided to sit on the movie concept for Mouse Guard when it, mm -hmm. when that dem when that demo got leaked when the demo got leaked and was put out into the public. I'm like, you guys had you guys had this in the pocket and you sat on it. There's a there's a lot of wasted potential and a lot of TRPG stuff. To be fair, yeah. There's so many multimedia, like cross media things that could happen that just don't. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, st I've stated in the past that I would pay good money for some for somebody to turn ex for, for somebody to turn exalted into an anime. Mm. And well, if, if Cyberpunk can get away with it, then I th then all bets are off. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, but one of the other ones, which, um, which. Makes which makes me smile that you brought th that you name dropped this one is Thirteenth Age. Mm, yeah, Thirteenth um, Age. There's not much direct mechanical influence from it, but a lot of the feeling that I got while listening to the um, the early Let's Play content from Thirteenth Age, and also Thirteenth Age was my my first kind of inkling that the world outside of me, in terms of RPGs, had moved forward a bit. The thirteenth age did include narrative-driven mechanics and resolution systems. It simplified a lot of roles um, and and the skill system, and everything else, using backgrounds. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was expecting to be crunchy was not so crunchy. It was still close to D and D, close to Pathfinder in many ways, um, but it was it just felt like a really fresh thing for me because I'd been out of all industry developments for so long. And it's one of those things that really gave me hope of like, this whole narrative fiction focus thing stuff, people like this now. <laughs> and maybe they always did, but like it's just not what I was exposed to when I was learning role-playing games. Yeah, and that's f that's fair enough. Yeah. Oh. Because I, I suppose I could see some, some um, connective tissue in terms of the theme of escalation. Mm -hmm. Like Thirteenth Age had the escalation die, the which escalation is giving die, you, yeah. giving you a giving you a gradual boost as an encounter goes on, and you have you ha you ha you have um, whether it be pressure when you're going down down to the depths or tracking how exposed you are. 
Oh, yeah. It's the, yeah, yeah it's the, the, um, the, the kind of iterative, iterative change through encounters. So things keep changing, I think is really important. And 13th Age did do that really well. Yeah, the other possibility I can see is um, the, way, the way that... I don't know how to put this the the way the way that um the the way that the up that upgrades are spread out um can be not too far removed from how, from how 13th age treated feats mm -hmm. you know where the the actual standalone feats are only as long enough to fill one page the yeah. majority of feats are enhancements to other abilities and well, well, you don't have ex well, you don't have that wor for, per se in this. What you what I do see in it is the way um the way a the way aspects and the like work as far as enhancing what's already present. Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, well as, and, the, and you can mix them together as well as, as yeah. Um, it is meant to be again iterative is is that word. It's a word I love as well. Um, characters in the wild sea are meant to be iterative. They're meant to grow. Not in big leaps, but slowly towards something that they can't see coming because you can't see the future. The players might have a plan of what they're after, but the opportunities presented, the things they can do, like the narrative, should change them as they as they adventure, as they explore. Mm -hmm. And the wild sea is not, it's not really a game of builds. Like you can make a starting build, but aiming for a kind of quote unquote high powered end build. I just I've never seen anyone do it. <laughs> you can get more powerful, but you you do it with a kind of realization as you go through of like oh, I can do this based on the things that have happened to you. So. Yeah, it's. It, I suppose I suppose if some if somebody really wanted to stretch the matter, they could probably do they could probably do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can power game technically, but you can power game in ways that are, are kind of weirdly niche. Like I've seen people make characters that can deal massive damage, the kind of things that can you know hurt leviathans uh, for as a as a matter of course, but then you know they might just trip over a rug or something and, and take enough damage to them. You know, there's always a trade off somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when it and when it comes to when it comes when it comes to try, when it comes to trying to quote unquote power game um, something like this, it it. Honestly, it would be it wouldn't be far removed from trying to power game, um, any game any game in the cipher system. <laughs> I, I don't have ever played the cipher system. Um, that's the, that's the one that powers like like Numenera and the Strange. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, I haven't played it, but I've uh, Numenera was quite impressive actually. So, mm -hmm. and of course Numenera got a vi got a video game adaptation so some years back. I'm still waiting for one on the Strange, but I know that would be very difficult to do. Kind well, of I'd like one for the Wild Sea, but you know, there's not one coming soon, so. Mm -hmm. But now t now with all with all of that with all of that said, uh, when it what would you say what would you say were some what would you say looking back at the Wild Sea were some of the um, some of the major lessons that you end, that you ended up learning from the creation of your your first true <laughs> entry in de in developing an RPG. Oh God! Uh, yeah. All right. Um, lesson number one: Don't try and put everything in. Like one of the problems with the that I had while writing the core book, and one of the reasons Storm and Root as an expansion exists in the first place, um, is because I had all these ideas, and I thought like I, I might just have one book. Like that, this might be it. So I've, I've got to try. And I did try and put everything in, and it took a lot of kind of cajoling and coaxing from the publisher to let me to, to get me to let go of some ideas um, and give them space in future publications or even in free stuff. Like we've released the free basic rules. We've also released our free, like, first 24 page adventure thing for like the starter adventure stuff. Um, and some of the ideas that I would have put in the core book have ended up in that free starter adventure in terms of like how to structure things, how to run things, not just in a way that works, but in a way that I would personally do it. Extra guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and if we'd, basically, if we put everything I wanted to put in the core book, it would be like 500 pages long. and would cost $100 to ship anywhere. 
So, you know, that was that was that was my big lesson. Uh, edit, edit yourself or let other people aggressively edit you. Um, and the other one was uh, global shipping is a nightmare. Do everything half a year before you need to. Uh, because it was, it was hell. <laughs> I mean, it was the tail of the pandemic when we shipped, so we were getting a lot of conflicting information and problems, and boats just stopped. And at one point, a whole crate of books was just sitting at the border for weeks and weeks. And uh, yeah, it was yeah everything everything to do with manufacturing and shipping. Uh, COVID screwed it all up, mm -hmm. um, and we did our best, but it it screwed up a lot of our delivery times as well. Luckily, when people got the books. They were super happy with them, um, which is that that's the main thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it may have taken us longer than we thought. But again, behind the scenes, had loads of nice messages from other designers saying, hey, don't worry, it's bad for everyone. You're doing all right. And that's that was always nice. Oh, yeah. but, uh, but, for this, but for this campaign, we have literally tried to do everything as early as possible in terms of setting this stuff up just to avoid that again. Even though the pandemic's over, shipping's still a bit of a mess. So, mm -hmm. and it's it's gonna it's gonna be for a while. It's gonna be for a while yet. But um, oh yeah, even, we're just gonna before, counteract it before anything bad happens this time. Yeah, even even before even before the coof hit everything, um, shipping it was shipping was always a nightmare for de for development. Mm. Uh, and well, I've I've never tr I've I've always I've always assumed that whatever. Whatever arrival date something says a thing is going to have, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I I remember. Well, I mean, I'm I'm still eagerly awaiting Silk Song, uh, which I know is you know a video game rather than a, a TRPG. But Silk Song, I remember uh, just over a year ago. In fact, about a year and a few months ago, I remember being told uh, Silk Song definitely happening this year. It didn't happen this year. Do I suddenly hate Soul Song? No, I was, they, they've got problems. Of course, they've got their problems. You know, the world is a messed up place. Yeah, but I just know that what they deliver is probably going to be good, and I'm happy to wait for that. I'd rather have something good and late than bad and on time. Well, there's that there's that quote that um that that's that's often used on the that's often used on the matter. A delayed game is eventually good. A rushed game is forever bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, it's true as well. Yeah, although you although you can go too you can go too far on that on that route as well. I mean, um, I have I have a list of things that are probably going to happen before Star Citizen hits 1.0. <laughs> yes, it's like Heat Death of the Universe included on there. Let's see, Heat Death of the Universe, <laughs> Arsenal stop <laughs> Arsenal actually being a good being a good football team for once, um, Man Man United not embarrassing themselves for one year. Um, <laughs> My my Vikings winning this. My Vikings winning a Super Bowl. You know things things that I know things that I know are going are not gonna happen for a long long ass time if they ever do, and they'll yeah. still happen before Starter Citizen is complete. Yeah. So actually, weirdly enough, it's a project I follow every now and then. It's like just I find it so fascinating. In a car crash kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Like, and the weirdest thing is. It's really impressive. A lot of what they do is really impressive, and then a lot of what they do is really baffling. I have compared it to the film Heaven's Gate. I have not seen it. Heaven's Gate isn't as a as a film on its own. It's all it's all right. Oh, um, very 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 ambitious for its time. If in, if you're ever curious, go with the Criterion version. Stay the hell away from the MGM cut. Okay, but. The story behind its making is where the crazy stuff happening is because the director wanted to make the most perfect movie that he most perfect um, Western deconstruction that he could, mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that he ended up having the cast do was outright insane, like having having them wait for having them do these long takes just so we could get the just so we could get this perfect sunrise scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that's the tip of the iceberg. There's there was a a final cut documentary on it years ago about how, how chaotic things were behind the scenes. Oh. You can that's kind of fun to watch actually. Because sometimes sometimes the creation of these kind of things is far more interesting and chaotic than the thing itself. The big oh, example yeah. everybody goes to is Apocalypse Now and how much of a 
Well, I'd call it a sh I'd call it a shit show, but it f I feel like that's doing it a disservice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it w it was bad it was bad enough that co it was bad enough that your director is lo is losing weight from sheer stress daily. Yeah. Oh. But what do you? How big do you see Storm and Root go going as far as its um, page count? Uh, we have an internal goal of about two hundred. Um, it is currently. Let me open up the uh, document here. Uh, it is currently sitting at. Oh, oh no, that's that's not too bad. It's currently sitting at two hundred and twelve. Um, I'd say my my maximum I wanted to go to is about two twenty, but I would be happier if it was close to two hundred. Again, uh, getting something that that's tight and that works in terms of mechanics, in terms of writing, um, and in terms of timing, uh, is is really important. Yeah, and obviously, um, obviously, t obviously, stretch goals can can mess with that can mess with that a bit. Yeah. But I don't worry too much about the the kind of the page count added by stretch goals, because as long as it only adds kind of between six and ten, we're still under that kind of upper limit, and I'm I'm fine with that. I like giving space to backers that that bring something new to the world. So actually, something I was discussing with people on my uh, Discord the other day um, when we talked about the, the concept, because a lot of people are very hesitant to allow uh, backers to have that that kind of hand in their world. Um, because for the, the, the core Wildsy book, we offered up, you know, work with me to create uh, creatures, work with me to create a Leviathan, that kind of stuff. And we're doing uh, less of it this time. We're doing some pirate gang stuff with backers, and we're uh, offering the option of, you know, having your own created character in the book mm -hmm. um, as a, an art piece more than anything else, but still. Um, but I, I love it because there are some of the things that came out of doing it for the core book that uh, I wouldn't have thought of and that have, I've actually used in some cases more than the stuff I made myself. Mm. Um, Spectropedes are the, are the one that, that um, comes to mind. In fact, in the... You know how um, like a lot of uh, tech companies name their products in iterative... <laughs> there's that word again. Iterative ways, like a name that starts with A, a name that starts with B for the next edition, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as, as their kind of project names. Like you might have Project Chalk and then Project. I'm going to think of it as Dumpling. Um, yeah. And then a Project starts with E. But yeah. Um, currently, Wild C internally is in S. And that is Spectropede. Mm -hmm. Like, I love it enough that the, the all of my working files now are named after a thing that a backer came up with. Like, it, it really had an impact on the world and on me. Great creature, the Spectropede. Really good. Got its own full page spread, mm -hmm. and I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing it. Mm. Uh, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that ha that happens around here on a daily basis. No, yeah, no problem at all. It's nice to have a break from writing or from feeling the need to self promote in a in a way that involves outreach people you don't know. It's nice talking to someone again who I've talked to before. <laughs> Yeah, no. I feel like I'm turning into a journalist, and I've never and I've never taken journalism studies. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning on the job. <laughs> yeah, that's that seems that seems to be the that seems to be the mantra of how, of how I became a a content creator of of um of throwing throwing myself throwing myself right into the middle of the deep end of the pool and saying swim, damn it. Yeah, there are worse ways to do it. Well. This way, at least you have to learn fast. Um, I remember, I remember a graphic designer named Paula Schur saying at a TED talk, "The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing." Yeah, yeah, that makes that tracks. <laughs> uh, well, case in point, the post-it note that was that was an accident. Yeah, no, I think I remember that. Not, I don't remember it being made, obviously, but I think I remember learning about that. Well, I. Somebody had, it was it was somebody taking an idea that had been deemed useless beforehand and find and finding an alternate way to to use it because it was invent because the adhesive was in, was already invented but was seen as a failure because it was temporary. Yeah. 
But yeah, wasn't it someone trying to make something that was incredibly sticky for a long period of time, and they made something that was mildly sticky for not very long? Mm -hmm. It is useless for its intended purpose, but not useless for everything. Yeah. And the, and um, that's that's something that I tr that's something that I try and keep I try and keep to, but. Of, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty yeah, more where that came. There will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Oh, and go back to Kickstarter.